I was following a question I have been asked across the years from the very beginning of doing this show where people wanted to know what are the recurring themes in these lives of grace and beauty. And, and, uh, and, and I also was following a phrase of Einstein, uh, not one of his most famous quotes, but one that I was very taken with that he, you know, he actually, Einstein, if he had a faith, it was in, it was in the, the scientific enterprise. And, and he really believed that science would be the human discipline that would transcend national boundaries and tribal rivalries. And then in the early and mid-century, he watched scientists become creators of weapons of mass destruction. He was very taken with Gandhi, his contemporary. And he said at one point that he had come to believe that, um, that lives like Gandhi and Jesus and Buddha and Moses, and he loved St. Francis of Assisi, um, <clears throat> that, th that, these were, um, sp that this was spiritual genius, genius in the art of living, and that the security and dignity and joy of the future of humanity needed this kind of genius as much as it needed the purveyors of objective knowledge. But I found that as I was tracing the idea of spiritual genius, that also felt so lofty. And one of my problems about the way we talk about saints is that, you know, or, or good people is we put them up on a pedestal and if they appear in the newspaper, they're usually in some fluffy sidebar and it's a story of somebody who you could never be like. So as I was really calling through this, all this material of, of my years of conversation, it was this quality of wisdom that kept rising up and also the realization that wisdom is accessible to all of us and that it emerges through the raw materials of our lives. And so it was a process by which I named that as what I was pursuing and that as something um, that weaves all as a possibility through all kinds of lives at all places on the spectrum of a lifetime. Mm -hmm. and, and that it's um, there for public life as well as individual life. And have you found that the word resonates? Because I feel like we've maybe lost the language of wisdom. Of wisdom. I'm very attentive to all the words we ruin. I think wisdom is a lucky one because we don't use it very much. Yeah. And so it's not really watered down. It's a little bit unexpected, yeah. but it has integrity. It's very uh, ecumenical yeah. and respectable yeah. to all kinds of people. I'm, I'm finding it um, language that people are enjoying. I also like the language of virtues, you know? Yeah. And with that one, <clears throat> I find, and as really tools for the art of living, and with that one, I do find that people um, over a certain age, that the, the, the language of virtues is really loaded for mm -hmm. them. That it's, you know, these were the things that were foisted on us. Yeah. And th th things you could fail at. But I find that younger people find that language of virtues very magnetic yeah. um, as practical tools, right? Like spiritual technologies to pin aspiration to action. I know lots of people today will be a bit like me in that we love listening to you put other people uh, in the limelight, and I'm always interested, perhaps, by what you're thinking, but I don't want to do that in a very confrontational way, because I know for a journalist it can be a bit, be a bit scary to suddenly yeah. be the subject. But what are, the, what are those spiritual t technologies, what are the virtues and the values that you personally have found helped you on your path to wisdom? Yeah, you're right. That's my least favorite question. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. Um, so I describe myself, I mean, I'm theologically educated, but I got a theological education after living in after being a thoroughly political person, working diplomatically in divided Berlin um, in the 1980s in that vanished world, I was surprised to find myself taking religion seriously in the world and in myself. And so I studied theology to test that and to know that I could, that it could involve the life of the mind, mm -hmm. that it could address the complexity of the world. Mm -hmm. You know, what, what I say about, so I am theologically educated, that, that flows into what I do. I found that a fantastic discipline for then moving way beyond Christianity, because I went to a Christian seminary. I say that my mother tongue in my homeland is Christianity. And, uh, you know, the texts, the, the rituals, uh, the traditions. That remains true. At this particular moment in my life, I'm not very active, officially active in that. I still think that I understand that as defining. I, I, I have a very serious practice of yoga, mm -hmm. which is, and I don't do very spiritual yoga. I do hot, sweaty, athletic yoga. But at this point in my life, I understand getting out of my head and into my body to be 
uh, spiritually important. Mm. And I actually believe that somehow the extent to which we are planted in our bodies and our physical selves, in all their flaws and all their grace, uh, also determines how spiritual we are able to be. Mm. So that's kind of a mystery I hold. Um, you know, I re I'm a reader. I have a very modest uh, meditation practice, which I don't even talk about very much in public, because this is all I can do. I do six minutes while my tea steeps in the morning. So, you know, I, I, I think I'm a very modern person, and that I'm availing myself of these traditions of the ages, which are so accessible to us now, but um, I, I, I also don't think I dabble.